people have done lots of varied statistics for sure. So, okay. so this is going to be a completely thorough analysis of multivariate statistics. It's just going to give you a little bit of a taste of the two of the most commonly used ones. A particular cluster analysis and principal components analysis. In all cases, they're about understanding signals and patterns in multi-dimensional data. So when you've got lots of variables or lots of components to your data, how do you tease the patterns out? So regardless of whether you're doing statistical modeling or whether you're going on to other kind of quantitative analysis or to sort of system the process-based modeling, the first step in any modeling work is to eyeball the data. So the human brain is much more sensitive to patterns than any mathematical algorithm out there. So you've got to have different ways of looking at the data to see if you can see the patterns there. If you can't see a pattern in data, it's actually not really there, even if you get a statistically significant result. Okay? I can't tell you the amount of times I've sat in the IWC commission and they've argued about whether there's a significant increase in Mickey Wales and the slope of the line is about one millimetre over 100 years. So that kind of ridiculousness just annoys science rather than advances. So the whole point is to bring out the information out of the data. So as we said, uh, not yesterday, but the day before, the truth isn't exactly what you observe. There's always a little bit of error in empirical measurements. So we have to try and advance it so we can pull out the information, the patterns, without having to worry about the noise. So cluster analysis is one of the first ways of doing that, and that's where you want to actually find groups of data than the distance between clusters. So you're trying to minimize this guy's distance and maximize that. So these are the steps that you go through when you're doing a cluster analysis. You have to get rid of what's like, missing data and that kind of stuff. Then you have to pick which distance metric you want to do, how you're going to set the criteria for whether it's a cluster or not, and then just go through actually looking what the outcome is. So there's lots of different distance metrics. The simplest one is just Euclidean distance, which is the way that we think about distance as the, the straight line between two points in a, in a plane. But there's lots of other ones. One of the other most common ones is the Manhattan, which is like a city block. So you can't cut across because there's buildings on a city, but you have to go follow, effectively follow the roads, and that's the Manhattan distance. There's lots of other distances as well, but they're the two most commonly used ones. If you have categorical data rather than quantitative data, then it's just proportional or percent disagreement that you use, so you create a quantitative distance metric of the available information. Then there's a whole range of linkage criteria, which in itself, like if I was to teach this as my undergrad or postgrad course, this would be like three or four weeks of work. So you have to get it in 10 seconds. So don't feel like you have to remember it all. But basically, these are the most common forms of doing linkage rules. The most common form is just to put, look at the nearest neighbour. So people on this set of tables will have a much shorter distance as they chain along their neighbourhood than if they tried to go this way. Okay, so that's your, your nearest neighbour linkage. The other one is to actually look to see the opposite. So these guys would probably still have if they tried to go to the most extreme end of their cluster instead of to the next cluster, they'd probably still have a shorter distance this way than if they tried to connect with, say, Okay. So it's about looking at the most... So it's about picking the point in the cluster to test. 
And it's really important when you have very spread out data, so there's no point to sit down there. There's also a whole bunch of more complicated ones where you look at pairs of points, or you look at sums of squares of points, and it comes down to how lumpy your data is. Is it sort of in very clear tight lumps that even without doing all these kind of math things you can see that there's a lumpy or a lumpy? Or is there sort of clouds of data and you've got to look at whether the cloud is more closely associated? To give you a bit of sense of what that looks like, uh, this is, there's two different ways of doing cluster analysis. Uh, the partitional way, where you're trying to partition up space. So these are clouds of data points. If you didn't have the red data, you could say that's really clear that the blue and green are separate clusters. But if you think about the red, where there's this, this kind of smear, how do you put it into a cluster? How do you know it's internally consistent? And so you look at the distribution, the density of points is one particular way. So there's a much stronger density of points here than by the time you get out to this cloud. So this is about clustering this kind of messy data well. Whereas this doesn't work very well. While you can still sort of see clusters, it's not really clear that there's a difference there. So you have to have extra information to help you determine that there's really a different cluster. And it gets harder and harder the more dimensions that you have because you have more and more ways that different kinds of data points can overlap. The most common form of cluster analysis that people come across though is actually probably the dendrogram where it's hierarchical. And there's two ways that you can build these. You can either be uh, divisive, which is the most common one, well, actually, you know, the plot the other way, start with agglomerative, which is you start with everything being separate and then you find, try to find things that bring them together. So a bit like the clustering, the colourful clustering we did on the trophic data in my talk the other day, you try and find things that bring them together so that you can build up ever more bigger clusters. And at some point you have a criterion where you say, well actually that's too, that's not got information anymore, it's too stuck together. So you draw a line across and say these are my separate clusters. People tend to, in genetics and stuff, or taxonomy, go back the other way, where they have everything pulled together and they branch it out to get the separate clusters, and that's sort of the divisive approach. So this is the kind of one that we're probably more used to seeing, where you split it out down the trees. Where things in these clusters here are more similar to each other than to the ones over there. Okay, so they're the steps. Like I said, it was a flying case of uh, cluster analysis. It's pretty simple in R. So this would do your whole cluster analysis in R. There's heaps of packages for it. So basically, if my data is the data set, um, you omit any missing data or you clean up your data, you might have to standardise it if they're on strongly different dimensions or there's a quite a range of values. Then you apply a distance metric, in this case we picked the Euclidean metric, but you can obviously use any of the ones. Then you have your, your kind of clustering method, and then you plot your outcome. So it's really a very fast way of doing it. Uh, and you can also put marks on there to show where you think the clusters are. So for instance, this is an example where we said that there's five different clusters at this criteria point, and it highlights what they are. Okay. So, the next topic we're going to cover is principal components analysis. So before we get to that, has anyone got any questions on cluster analysis? Yep. So I have a collaborator. Um, I get my 10,000 steps a day on this <laughs> I have a collaborator who really likes k means clustering, but I feel like you have to do something before you know how many clusters you want to ask. I forgot to say that. you typically do a cluster analysis or PCA, or how do you get to the number? Okay, so she gets extra points because I forgot to read my slide where that problem was. Um, so k means clustering is a little bit of a sensitive topic for the reason that was just brought up because you have to define ahead of time how many clusters you think there are. So it's not as objective, I would say. So there's other... If we quickly raise back. Uh, if we look at these things here, the k means mean you do have to guess beforehand, so it can be literally a guess, but it just doesn't feel as nice. But it is a very common method. It's by far the most common method, but you have to do this guessing. Whereas if you use distribution or density-based approaches, you've got less of those. But to really get to the heart of that, there's quite a large literature, so if you're doing a lot of cluster analysis, I think you really need to be aware yourself what the pros and cons of the different approaches are. 
Okay, so time for pizza. So I never appreciate how much pizza there would be in Brazil. But it would go to the heart of my statistical professor's um, his soul. He was a Belgian. Um, it took me three weeks of his class to realise that X was actually just an X instead of some special symbol that I had to learn. And the way that he described PCA was with pizza because he loved having pizza almost as much as I love having ice cream. And the way that he said to imagine a PCA was if you have a picture on the side, you can't tell what's really there. But if you turn it over, you're, you're just rotating. You have a very good idea of what's in that. So again, if you think of the pepperoni as the date points, if it's on the side, you can't really see how those data points are really spread out. They all kind of appear on top of each other. But once you rotate it, you can see the patterns. You can see them more spread out. That's basically what happens with a PCA. So if you pick, if you pick your dimension poorly, then all of the data points come very close together. So these four would be on top of each other, these two would be effectively on top of each other, and so these four. So you're not getting much information out of it. But if you pick a different dimension, they're much more evenly spread out and the variance is maximised. And that's what you're trying to do with PCA. You're trying to re-rotate the data so that you spread it out. So you uh, cover as much variance as possible so that the patterns are clearer. The eigenvector analysis for anyone who actually does lots of maths is just the direction of this axis. And the eigenvalue is the amount of variance explained by doing that rotation. So if we look at this, for instance, on this kind of axis, if you tried to plot these data points without the colouring, you wouldn't realise that there's actually two different area sort of clusters in there because they're all over overlap. But if you rotate it, like the, where those lines are, so you get the new axis, you can see that there's clear groupings in that data. And that's the value of PCA, particularly in really high dimensional space where humans don't easily think. It can turn things around so you can see the patterns more clearly. So, and on top of that, you can then put in um, sort of covariates and potential drivers in the system. So you can see what we might be drawing out those patterns, what might be the dictating factor leading to those patterns. So for instance, in this example, Temperature might be what's determining the red group, whereas effort applied to the fishing might be what's determining the blue one. Again, it's a very simple process to do a PCA in something like R. You read in your data, you put through your, a factor in, you do your actual principal components, and then you get your individual loadings. And it's important to look at the loadings. So this is the kind of output you'll get, and you can see cumulatively with the loadings what proportion of the variance is being covered. So what you're looking for is this is an example where you probably put a break in here just because it's easy at three and four dimensions to imagine it, but there's no clear break in a set of principal components that clearly describe the majority of the information. What you're hoping for is something that looks like that, where one or two dimensions actually captures all of that variation pretty well. Once you find those breakpoints, then you start to try and plot that space up. So this is an example from some of my work, for instance, where they explained, I think, about 80% of the variance. And then we could start to figure out what was the what was driving these different axes. Was it temperature? Was it pH? Was it effort? Was it management? Um, one of the strongest ones in this particular data set was a level of corruption. So you can tease out the factors that are hard to maybe get your head around in a truly quantitative sense, but as soon as you can put some degree of qualitative index around it, like the Gini index and those kind of things, you can start to combine data from very different data sources. So this is an example again of where um, we did it, there was appeared to be some clustering, but it wasn't really clear, we started overlaying what extra information that we had. So I knew what the source of these different groups were. So this is some example output from some simulations that we did. And we knew that all of these simulations actually come from RCP 8.5. This is one where we hadn't allowed for any evolution. And then this messy part, um, though they did still actually cluster out fairly well, was from the, the more moderate RCPs. So effectively you could have so there wasn't a huge effect on the system in where there was regime shift, which was the simplest split you could see in that, 
but even within that, you could actually tease apart cumulative effects versus um, just straight single things like fisheries because of that additional knowledge we had to overlay on top. So PCA is a really good way of starting that and starting that exploration. In some cases, it's the end point of the paper. But in a lot of the work that I do, it's like the, the qualitative modelling that we talked about the other day would be the first step. PCA analysis of the different things is the second step. You do your modelling and then you use statistical properties again at the other end. So that's a little warning to come again from my aged statistics professor was that while we apply statistical methods to model output, like PCAs, we have to be a little bit careful because we actually fundamentally break one of the principal assumptions of statistics, which is that you don't actually know the true underlying model. In this kind of output, we do know the true underlying kind of model. So you have to be a little bit careful how you use the statistics, but most of the statistical methods will still actually work. And there's many different ways of representing that. So you don't have to represent it in these kind of plots. R has a zillion ways of plotting anything, and this is a way of actually looking at all of the different principal components that come out of the data and colour coding by some criteria that you have to see how whether the patterns are still there, if they break down, because they start to do. Okay, so the, the last part is to look for influences. So particular data points that are outliers or um, have quite a lot of leverage in a data set, so I forgot to draw it again, but so just imagine you have a straight line piece of the data all lines up in a straight line. If it's a data point at the very extreme end and it's kind of off there by itself, it has a lot of leverage on that line, the shape of that line. It doesn't mean it's necessarily an outlier, but you still have to be a bit careful about it because you don't have supporting data points around it to make sure it's really right on the line. Whereas back at this end where you've got lots of data, a point way above the line is obviously an outlier. It doesn't have as much leverage because there's other data points holding the line down, but it's obviously an outlier that's still influencing the result. So an influence plot shows you which points are having that kind of pressure on the results that you're getting. So these cloud points out here have much more leverage or residual because they're an outlier than these cloud points out here that were sitting on the main pack. So it's always good to do that kind of analysis so you can figure out how much of the story you're telling is dependent on a single data point, given that we're never sure how true those data points are. Really so that's kind of the two main ways of doing multigrade statistics. There's shitloads of other ways. Um, factor analysis is another way that has been used quite successfully. Instead of looking at the total variance, it looks at shared variance within properties. So one way that this has proved very helpful in um, quantitative modelling is you can do a factor analysis on the sensitivity of your parameters. So for instance, in Atlantis, there's, I think it's how many, so I'll make a number up, which is pretty close to the ballpark, about 10,000 parameters. Of those, there's only about six that really make a huge difference in any one instance for any one species. But we figured that out in two ways. One, I've been doing it for 20 years, so I have 20 years of experience. If I pull that, nothing happens. If I pull this, something big happens. But I also had a PhD student who went and did his PhD on effectively doing a factor analysis of my PhD. And at the end of that process, he came out, thankfully, with the same set of parameters that I thought were important, so that was good confirmation. But it is a way of exploring that space. And we couldn't do a classical sensitivity analysis on my PhD because it would have taken longer than the known universe has existed and no committee is going to wait that long for you to end your thesis. So we had to find more inventive ways of looking at the sensitivity of these models. And this is one way of doing it. So it can be done in an exploratory sense to see if you can find some underlying structure or in a confirmation sense to see if whether the expected structure is actually what you find. Similarly, with canonical discrimination analysis, you're looking at combinations and correlations in internal features or internal properties. It's used a little bit, well, it's probably used more in ecology than I appreciate because I really am not thinking up with all of the literature these days. Uh, but it's used quite a lot in the broader world by uh, credit score agencies, uh, national security when they do a face check at the US border, those kind of properties. So this is where a lot of those multivariate statistical processes are being put to a great extent, but it also means that there's a lot of software and a lot of routines out there to help you do the same kind of stuff. So if you're 
say for instance collect video data on an underwater trawl, there's quite a lot of these kind of analyses now that let you do pattern recognition so that they count the fish for you or they count the coral cover for you without you're sitting yourself in a dark room and boring yourself to death for you by watching very slow benthic trawls go past. <coughs> the other way of doing probably the last method of cover is the multi-dimensional scaling, which is just another way of trying to understand the structure inside your data, particularly high dimensional data. Uh, it has many more, pro well it has pros in the sense that it doesn't make assumptions that you know what the underlying structure is already. So whereas K means, for instance, you had to guess the clusters beforehand, you don't have to make any of those kind of assumptions with MDS. Um, it's up to you, there's no prescribed distance metric to use with it, you can use any distance metric you like. But on the other hand, uh, it's incredibly slow. Not so much if you go to a computer around or something like that. Modern computers are making that easier all the time, but the bigger the data set, the slower the process to do some of these. But the bigger risk is that because if it uses a minimization scheme, it can get caught in local minima. So it won't necessarily find the absolute best solution, it can get stuck. Okay.